Amanda Coolidge is the Associate Director of Open Education at BC Campus in British Columbia, Canada. She leads the province's initiatives in open education from open textbooks to open pedagogy and with a team of eight other people who has worked across BC to enhance access for students. Amanda has a master's in educational technology and has had many years of experience as an instructional designer at various universities across Canada. Amanda has worked in open education in Calgary, Alberta, Nairobi, Kenya, and in British Columbia. As you will hear from her talk, she has a very unique story of growing up in six different countries. When Amanda's not at work, she can often be found on the beaches and in the woods of British Columbia, traveling with her family in their 32-foot fifth wheel RV. And I had the pleasure of her being in Phoenix during one of our open ed events, and she's just dropped in. She heard we were having this event, came on in, and I got to meet Amanda, and I was like starstruck and so excited. And then she, I invited her to our panel on her vacation, and she's like, sure, let me join you and meet your faculty and share my experiences, which was so impactful for our faculty. Um, one really cool thing that she's doing next week, which I thought was absolutely amazing, um, she's very passionate about jazzercise, and she's going to be performing in the Disneyland Parade next week with her jazzercise team. Thank you, thank you. Very cool. <laughs> Please welcome me in joining my friend Amanda Coolidge. Thank you. Okay. Um, so before I get started, I just wanted to um, say something that um, I think is really important to talk about. So I realize that some of you are concerned that this might be the final open education conference. And some of you have even asked me how it feels to be the final keynote at the open education conference. And I would like to say that I do not believe that this is the final. In fact, there have been many exciting conversations in the halls about what is next and where do we go from here. With the founder of this event, David Wiley, stepping down, this is really up to the community now. Some of us gathered yesterday, and David would like me to let you know that he was not one of those people who gathered um, yesterday afternoon, to have this conversation and to ask what is next. All of the results, we decided to take a first step by putting together a form, which you should be able to see on the screen. Um, and all of the results of the form there, there are questions that ask what is next, and we're asking for the community to be able to provide some insight on this. And if you have thoughts and some time, please consider using the following form. Can you all see it? Yeah. Okay, so this is the form, so please take an opportunity to write down the URL or tweet about it, um, because I think it's really important that we hear what everybody would like. And now I will start my keynote. In Canada, we're in a period of reconciliation. Reconciliation is about establishing and maintaining a mutually respectful relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. And in order for that to happen, there has to be awareness of the past, an acknowledgement of the harm that has been inflicted, an atonement for the causes, an action to change behavior. In this process, we acknowledge the land on which we are situated and we give thankful respect to the land and its peoples. In our acknowledgement, we do not just pay tribute to the past, but we acknowledge our collective place and responsibility for the future. I'm going to talk a lot this morning about origin stories, and in doing so, I would like to start with the understanding of the origin of our place and space here and where we have been for the past few days. For thousands of years, the Udam, Yavapki, Akimel Udam and Hohokam nations have walked gently on the territories where we are based today. And I am committed to honoring and respecting the First Peoples, and I thank them for their hospitality. In addition, I'm also going to talk about communities and collaboration. And when I think about communities, I'm often drawn to the power of the indigenous communities in British Columbia. This piece of art titled Pulling Together was created by the First Nations artist Luann Neal, 
and was inspired by the annual gathering of ocean-going canoes through tribal journeys. The art is on the cover of each of BC campus's indigenization guides, the open professional learning series developed to support the indigenization and professional practice of institutions. The artwork is intended to represent the connections each of us have to our respective nations and to one another as we pull together. Working toward our common visions, we move forward in sync so that we can continue to build and manifest strong, healthy communities with foundations rooted in our ancient ways. Please keep this in mind as we consider our own origin stories and how we as a community can pull together working toward our common visions. I would also like to offer an, 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 I would also like to offer an acknowledgement of thanks to the program committee for the invitation to be asked to stand among so many mentors, colleagues, and friends. It's really an honor to speak in front of all of you today. And thank you to everyone who's made my family feel so welcome. It's my son's second education, uh, open education conference, and he's only seven. And it's my husband's first. So we all arrive here with our origin stories and lived experiences, all of which provide insight into our cultures and our worldviews. And my story will provide context for where my thoughts and ideas generate from. This is a picture of me at seven with traditional Polish costume on. Truthfully, I've never been comfortable giving my origin story because it always feels very hard to explain. It's far from the norm, and as a child, and even as an adult, I long to belong. I was born in Washington, D.C. My father is American and was in the United States Foreign Service. My mother is Canadian from Prince Edward Island and was a school board trustee, a librarian, a restaurant manager, and took on many other doer roles. So you can probably guess where I get my energy from. With my father's role in the Foreign Service, we moved a lot as a family. We lived in England, Poland, Pakistan, Guatemala, the United States, and then I moved to Canada to start university in Nova Scotia. Growing up, I attended schools that had over 40 nationalities represented across 200 students. My upbringing taught me a few things, to be adaptable, to respect cultural differences, and that there is an extreme unfairness, a power to the privileged in our system. While I may have been living overseas in developing countries, I was also living in homes fully furnished with access to drivers, cooks, and people who did our laundry. And I knew that on the other side of the gate to my home and beyond the walls of my international school, lives were not privileged. We lived in Poland during martial law. A curfew was imposed, the national borders sealed, airports closed, road access to main cities restricted, telephone lines were disconnected, mail was subject to censorship, and classes in schools and universities suspended. While I was living in Pakistan, less than 39% of Pakistani girls attended high school in urban areas, and less than 25% of girls attended high school in rural areas. When it was time to apply for university, and no, this is not me at my uh, application stage, um, <laughs> my first choice was Union College in Schenectady, New York. But even as a white middle class student, I couldn't afford to attend. I was awarded a scholarship that would cover one third of the expenses, but that was not going to alleviate what I saw as a future of financial burden. I chose to attend Acadia University in Nova Scotia. In 1997, when I started my first year, the institution decided it would have what was known as the first laptop program for students. When you arrived on campus, you were given an ID card and an IBM ThinkPad. And one of the innovative things that Acadia did was hire students to work with faculty to better understand how to use the technology in the classroom and to assist in redesigning courses alongside faculty. So I decided to apply to be one of those students to co-create uh, courses and develop materials. And I, as I look back now, I realize I probably was a little bit ahead of the game in open pedagogy. I loved being a student instructional designer. 
The full-time employees taught me what I needed to know. They instructed me in terms of what questions to ask, how to be curious, and how to interact with faculty. And because of this experience, I'm an extreme advocate for hiring students at our workplaces. When I graduated, I moved to Calgary, Alberta, and got a job with Mount Royal University as an instructional designer. And my cultural background is the result of many cultures. And while that sounds beautiful and lofty, it is hard. I always wanted to be from somewhere. And when we returned to the United States when I was 16, I felt lost. And my background did not fit in with the traditional suburban teen. I longed for a sense of belonging. In 2006, I moved from Calgary, Alberta to Nairobi, Kenya to work with the African Virtual University, the Open University, and the BBC to create the first repository of open educational resources developed by African educators for African educators. The repository TESA, Teacher Education in Sub-Saharan Africa, is for primary level educators, is available in four languages, and ranges in subject areas from English to life skills to science. And I found my belonging in 2006 when I was first introduced to open education in Kenya. I felt welcomed into a newly established community and I felt that the work I was doing was contributing to a greater cause. I think many of us have found our sense of belonging through open education. We've witnessed, been a part of, or are currently struggling with the incongruence of the status quo. And our belonging in this field is a result of our want to do better. I believe that the purpose of our work as educators, as policymakers, as system conveners, is to improve access to education, to make education affordable to the masses and not just the privileged few, and most importantly, to ensure our students are successful. In Can However, the rising cost of post-secondary education is not improving success. In Canada, 320 undergraduates in British Columbia were asked how much they spent on textbooks in the last 12 months, and the average was about $700. In 2017, in a survey of over 300 students in British Columbia, 54% said they had not bought a textbook at least once due to cost. 27% said they had taken fewer courses. 26 said they didn't even register for the course because of the cost of the book and 17 said they had dropped or withdrawn from a course. And textbooks are far from the only issue. In British Columbia, my colleague Krista Lambert conduct conducted research on classes that require access to homework systems or digital publisher resources and found that students pay on average $92 per course for an access code. Similar findings were cited in a 2016 report by the Student Public Interest Research Group. The average cost of an access code sold, sold solo, that it means not bundled with a textbook, was $100. These access codes actually prevent access for our students. Article 26 of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that higher education shall be accessible to all, which is impossible when it's just for the privileged few. The late Aaron Schwartz was a computer programmer, writer, political organizer, and internet hacktivist. His passing was a tragedy for the commons. At age 14, he helped to develop the RSS software that enables the syndication of information over the internet. At 15, he emailed Lawrence Lessig and helped to write the code for Creative Commons. At 19, he was a developer of Reddit. In 2011, Schwartz was arrested by MIT police on state breaking and entering charges after connecting a computer to the MIT network in an unmarked and unlocked closet and he set it to download academic journals systematically from JSTOR. In his Guerrilla Open Access Manifesto paper, Schwartz writes, those with access to these resources, students, librarians, scientists, you have been given a privilege. You get to feed at this banquet of knowledge while the rest of the world is locked out. But you need not, indeed you morally cannot, Keep this privilege for yourselves. 
We need to do better. The belonging I felt in open education in Kenya then led me to British Columbia, Canada, where I now lead the open education initiatives across the province. I work for a BC campus, and the organization has been working in open education since 2003. BC campus serves the entire province of British Columbia, and our role is to work with the 25 public post-secondary institutions across the province in the areas of educational technology, teaching and learning, and open education. We've been an organization for 16 years, and we're primarily funded through our Ministry of Advanced Education Skills and Training, and open education has received additional funding from the Hewlett Foundation. We are collaborators, innovators, and system conveners. Our open education work began in 2003 when we started distributing grants to faculty to create and share openly licensed courses. In 2012, our Minister of Advanced Education announced that the province of British Columbia would receive $1 million to support the development of open textbooks. And since that time, we've received another million dollars from the government, as well as $250,000 to create the first tuition-free and zero textbook cost program for adult basic education in North America. And in April of this year, we received $3 million, the largest investment in Canada toward making education accessible to all students through open education. When our open textbook project began in 2012, we started with bringing in open textbooks from other collections. We asked faculty to review the textbooks in the collection, and we incentivized them with $250 for each review. As reviews came back, there was a growing trend that indicated that many of the reviewers would use the open textbook if it was changed to include more Canadian examples and was in better alignment of the learning outcomes of their British Columbia courses. We then put a call out for adaptations, and using Pressbooks as our publishing tool, we were able to work with faculty across British Columbia to adapt some of the open textbooks to meet their needs. Since the launch of the BC Open Textbook Project in 2012, BC has saved students more than $14 million, impacted more than 130,000 students, and has a growing open textbook collection of more than 300 books and guides for post-secondary education. From 2006 to 2008, when I was working on the TESSA project, I witnessed educators creating content and adapting resources to localize them to 10 country contexts. Curriculum in Sudan was translated to Arabic and used geographical examples from Sudan. Curriculum in Kenya was adapted for Swahili and English. Science experiments and curriculum outlines were adapted and localized so students and educators could use the materials available to them on the land. In addition, through collaboration, the post-secondary institutions in sub-Saharan Africa were printing materials from the TESSA website and delivering the curriculum to educators in the field through mail. These institutions were not allowing a lack of an internet connection to stop them from impacting educators. They saw that their role in furthering education of students across their country was to ensure that their materials were accessible and that their teachers would be able to impact students regardless of where they live and regardless of their connectivity. This was the first project that I believe has successfully localized and customized content for students and educators so that they can see themselves in the curriculum and use the resources available in their context and read the materials in their language. Understand this if you understand nothing. It is a powerful thing to be seen. How many of your students see themselves and their own origin stories in their curriculum? How many of your students struggle with instructions that is too disconnected from their own experiences? Dr. Christina Hendricks of the University of British Columbia conducted research in 2017 titled The Adoption of an Open Textbook in a Large Physics Course. In her survey, she asked students what they liked most about the open textbook. Their top response, it was customized. Customization, inclusion, diversity, accessibility are all under the umbrella of equity. And isn't that what we're trying to do here? Create an equitable environment for our students to be successful? 
New America, a nonpartisan nonprofit in Washington, D.C., has been writing a blog series to explore the possibilities for creating and implementing inclusive learning materials with a focus on leveraging OER. In one of her posts, Sabia Prescott explains that LGBTQ students are never taught material that reflects, represents, or validates their identity, and as a consequence, LGBTQ students are less engaged in school, graduate at lower rates, and face much higher rates of mental health conditions than their non-LGBTQ counterparts. California, New Jersey, Illinois, and Colorado are now the first four states to require curricula in public schools to include identities and histories of LGBTQ people and people with disabilities. And this is where the possibility of open textbooks lie with these states. Sabia writes, by openly licensing new textbooks, states could save money and share resources with other education systems across the country, making it easier for uh, schools everywhere to access high quality inclusive content. OER also has the power to support content adaptation in ways traditional textbooks do not. And with this new legislation, these states are updating their textbooks for the first time in 10 years. And the content that goes into those textbooks may very well be used to teach students for another 10 years. Jess Mitchell notes, if we aren't designing for inclusion, then we are saying we are comfortable with a certain population of people not being involved. And I am not okay with this. For the first time, it is possible that LGBTQ students will be seen in the curriculum. Imagine if every student, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, religion, and more, could see themselves in the curriculum being used. I shared with you my origin story. It's time to ask your students theirs. Catherine Mayer, the executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation, says that the idea that knowledge should be open and free is a radical challenge. Open is radical in the, in the sense that knowledge should not be in the domain of the privileged few. It challenges what comes before and the structures that have been built. And our education institutions are full of structures. We are asking institutions to change, and when we ask people to change, we're asking them to go against their sense of belonging, of what their institutional culture is and has always been. To best respond to change and orchestrate change in our context, it's time to ask, what is the origin story and the cultural background of your institution? How does it affect decisions made? Are open values evident in your institutional or your school district's vision or mission? Our community, the open education community, can often be fraught with the misunderstandings and critiques that are fundamentally based on the differing views of our origin stories. For some, the origin story of open education is either based on the open source software movement, or perhaps a social justice movement, or maybe even a Mormon agenda. But we can actually see the roots of open education dating back to the 1960s and 1970s, whereby it was a social movement response. In Martin Weller's book, Battle for Open, he cites the launch of the open universities in the UK as a way to open up education to people who were otherwise excluded because they either lacked the qualifications to enter higher education or their lifestyle and commitments meant they could not commit to full-time education. Open didn't necessarily mean free. It meant easily accessible to the masses. With the rise of the internet and the launch of the Creative Commons licenses, this was where the opportunity to take the principles of open universities, access to affordable education, and apply an open license to curriculum to share, remix, revise, and reuse learning materials. In today's climate, we represent, and rightfully so, the origin story of open education through numbers. The total student debt in the United States stands at approximately $1.5 trillion. The Canadian federal government is using interest fees on student loans as a source of revenue that is projected to earn approximately $862 million in just this last year. 44 million Americans owe student loans. The average Arizona student state debt is $33,482. In 
In British Columbia, the student loan debt averages at $28,000. And when debt reaches $10,000, student program completion rates drop from 59% to 8%. According to the Institute for College Access and Success, Bachelor degree recipients who were black, who received Pell Grants, who were the first in their family to attend college, and who attended for-profit colleges were more likely to default on their loans. From buying a home to getting married and even having children, an increasing number of young adults are putting off major milestones because of that one large liability. Audre Lorde, a black queer poet, writes, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not lead single issue lives. Student loan debt is not the result of tuition fees alone. It includes books, supplies, tuition, fees, transportation costs, room and board, and other living expenses. When we talk about access and affordability in education, we are talking directly to the effect it has on student success, whether you define success as student completion, improved learning outcomes, or retention. At BC campus, communities are at the heart of the work we do. My colleague Clint Lalonde wrote a blog post a couple of months ago about the open homework systems project we at BC campus are working on. He wrote, ultimately, for any open education project to succeed and be sustainable, it has to be about developing a community. At the start of the Open Textbook Project in 2012, we gathered librarians together to create the first open education librarians community in British Columbia. The BC Open Education Librarians is a supportive community to learn about open education practices. Together, they seek to build support for librarians and faculty in advocating for the use of OER in their home institution by sharing knowledges and practices that impact higher education. The librarians who make up this community have worked together to create libguides, shared best practices, presented at multiple conferences, and most importantly, they have worked together to ensure that access to educational resource, resources is unencumbered by ownership and cost. We've also been, excuse me, we've also been very focused on a research community in British Columbia. In 2014, we started the Faculty Fellows Program, which brings together uh, instructors to engage in research that determines the efficacy of open textbook use in British Columbia institutions. The fellows provide mentorship to faculty new to open textbooks through presentations, consultations, and conduct outreach activities. In 2016, my team embarked on an ambitious project to bring the OpenStax book into Pressbooks so that all of you, the commons, could easily edit, adapt, and customize the high quality OpenStax books to meet the needs of your students. Just this fall, with the support of co-op students and the work of Lori Asaf and jo Josie Gray, there are now 33 OpenStax books available in Pressbooks. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> this work, while beneficial to the BC community, has had a profound impact on the entire open education community. And when we have the opportunity to make works more accessible in the open community, it benefits us all. In British Columbia, institutions interested in open education have started open education working groups. These working groups have launched open publishing systems, created open policies, devised grant incentive programs, hired students to assist in the adaption of textbooks, hosted workshops and information sessions, and delivered presentations to their institutional community. The working groups are made up of students, administrators, faculty, instructional designers, librarians, bookstore managers, the registrar, IT, and more. Open education affects and requires stakeholders from all areas of the institution as each person will have a different lens on how to move open education forward based on their perspective and lived experience with the institutional culture. We see this outside of British Columbia as well with the Open Textbook Network, which is a vibrant and supportive community that advances the use of open educational resources and practices through member organizations. SPARC's Open Education Leadership Fellows Program is another example. 
It's an intensive professional development program to empower library professionals with the knowledge, skills, and connections to lead successful open education initiatives that benefit students. And in K through 12, we have seen communities grow and gather through the Go Open initiative, which is a community of state and district leaders collaborating to build knowledge and use OER to transform teaching and learning. These are high impact communities that are comprised of people that see the work of others in their network as integral to their ability to achieve impact. Mary Burgess, BC Campus's Executive Director, has transformed the meaning of support for a community specifically when it comes to inclusive practices at our events. For a community to thrive and feel welcome, each member must feel supported, which is why at our BC Campus events we offer free childcare for parents who seek both professional development and financial support. We offer scholarships to instructors and staff who would not otherwise be able to attend due to the lack of professional development funds at their institutions. And if you're a student wishing to attend one of our events, your registration is free. We also have a code of conduct because we are dedicated to providing a harassment-free event experience for everyone. Gathering a community together can be easy. Ensuring the community feels supported and functions on the realm of possibility and not fear, that is where the work is. I bring up these origin stories of open education because I believe that each of you has come to this community for reasons based on your own origin story. It could be your response to access, to affordability, to content creation, pedagogy, technology, publishing, open source. And whether it is because of the technology or the social justice reason, you are here, and that is what matters. But what I am concerned about is that the open education community we have built is divided because we have lost our fundamental goal of why we sit in this room, and that is to enhance student success through accessible education. Now we're going to take a little bit of detour to Iowa. My team's laughing here because they know exactly where I go with this one. So in the lead up to the 2006 Democratic primaries, Dan Pfeiffer, Obama for America National Communications Director, told his team, if you can win Iowa, then everything else was possible. According to Johannes Abraham, the Des Moines field organizer, part of the training was that they set expectations like, look, we're going down in the national polls, and those don't matter. Iowa is the key to everything. David Plouffe, the national campaign manager, said from the very moment Barack Obama started talking about running for president to the moment he announced, what crystallized was a belief that we needed to win Iowa. And that was our, really our only chance. So every decision was, how does this help us win Iowa? And if the answer is that it doesn't, then we don't do it. But what is our Iowa? I believe that our Iowa as a community is to ensure our students are successful in their learning through accessible education. And if we are going to win Iowa, that is make learning accessible to each student in every classroom, then the only way I see that happening is through open education, open resources, open science, open data, open source, open access, open. While community is the noun, collaboration is the verb. For open education initiatives to be sustainable, we must collaborate with each other in this room and with others not in this room. I hope that over the course of the few days, you've been able to make connections and identify collaborations where they would work to make our community stronger and more sustainable. Based on a decade of research developing detailed case studies on a range of successful networks, Jane Way Skillam and Nora Silver of the University of California, Berkeley, identified a common set of patterns that are essential to effective collaboration. One such pattern that has resonated deeply with me is build constellations rather than lone stars. 
That is, build a larger system to develop on the mission and not to become the market leader. At BC campus, our primary focus is to support the post-secondary institutions in British Columbia as they adopt, adapt, and evolve their teaching and learning practices to create a better experience for students. We achieve this through a supportive approach to advanced pedagogies, a focus on impactful practice, and collaboration with partners in British Columbia and around the world. When I was prepping for this keynote, I asked a few people in the open education community, what message would you all like to hear from me? And all of them said, I'm paraphrasing a bit, how BC campus has been able to collaborate with so many diverse partners. I really believe that our, we've been successful with our collaboration because of our core values. Open, sharing, access, accountability, quality, respect. We have consistently built constellations and not lone stars. We know collaboration is hard, but we see collaboration as a cornerstone of sustainability to the open movement. So I want to share with you a few examples of how we have collaborated and why we all have to stop tweaking in silos. At BC campus, we've used the sprint model to create both open textbooks and ancillary resources. In 2015, my colleague Clint and I were part of the first open textbook sprint. We brought together five geography faculty from four institutions for four days to plan and draft a nearly 200-page open textbook for British Columbia Regional Geography. Faculty were supported by a librarian, a graphic artist, facilitators, and BC campus staff, which permitted the faculty to focus on their subject matter expertise. This effort produced a local, uh, an open textbook that served a local need, which has since been adopted at several BC institutions. And we took a similar approach when several BC psychology faculty identified that the absence of a question bank was inhibiting the adoption of a newly adapted Canadian edition of an open textbook for introductory psychology. So in this case, 17 faculty from six institutions came together for two days to write and peer review nearly 1,000 multiple choice questions. And the result is that five out of six institutions adopted the open textbook within the year. This type of collaboration has also seen success at OpenStax, where each year they host a creator fest. They bring together the OpenStax user community to collaborate and put knowledge into practice. Instructors develop ancillary resources, like test banks, problem sets, and enhanced PowerPoint slides. The sprint model reduces individual workload, results in the production of a higher quality resource, and instantly provides inter-institutional credibility of the OER. In 2014, I worked with Tara Robertson, now at Mozilla, formerly with the Center for Accessible Post-Secondary Education Resources, and Sue Doner of Camosun College to create the BC Open Textbook Accessibility Toolkit. The reason for this collaboration was that because after creating all of the open textbooks in our collection, the concern was, how do we allow our work to be both open and accessible? We began ask, ask, asking ourselves about true access for all students, including students with visual disabilities. Were we providing a textbook that could be, in fact, be used by the students on day one and allow them to feel a sense of belonging in the classroom? At the end of 2014, we contacted the disability service coordinators at partner institutions to find student participants with print disabilities to evaluate BC Open textbooks. The participants were asked to look at five chapters from the library and provide their evaluation. And this worked really well, but we started to notice that some of the students were responding to some questions and some were not responding to some questions. So we decided to take it further and bring them in for a half day focus group. So we were able to see them reading and accessing the materials on their different devices. Based on the student feedback, we were now able to make our own textbooks more accessible, and we now have an employee, Josie Gray, dedicated to inclusive and accessible design on our open education team. The Rebus community is an amazing example of collaboration. 
It's a dedicated platform for creating and publishing open textbooks. Rebus provides OER projects with publishing guidance, support forums, a contributor marketplace, and a dedicated discussion space. Their most recent publication, Introduction to Philosophy, had 35 collaborators. Collaborations can also happen in ways that may see, ca seem counterculture to the open education movement. Collaborations in partnership with for-profit entities, such as Lumen Learning, or nonprofits partnering with for-profits in the case of OpenStax's Ally program. And you know what? I believe that is okay. It is okay because while they may be using different funding models, they are working towards the same Iowa to ensure students are successful in their learning through accessible and low-cost education. Successful collaborations can also result in profound policy changes. At the University of British Columbia, there is now inclusion of language recognizing open in the institution's tenure and promotion guide. OER are now listed as a type of evidence that candidates could present for evaluation, which provides a way for faculty to get formally recognized for engaging in OER activities. This only happened because of a collaboration between the Teaching and Learning Center and the Students' Union. This would never have happened without collaboration. In addition to institutional collaborations, we've also been involved in interprovincial and global collaborations. In 2012, when the Open Textbook Project was launched, Mary Burgess made it a point to reach out to leaders in the field, those who were doing the work, testing the waters, and making waves in open education. The 20 people gathered at the table represented 14 different organizations, including OpenStax, US Perg, Right to Research Coalition, Creative Commons, Lumen Learning, 20 Million Minds, Washington State, and eCampus Alberta. Since that time, we have continued our efforts of collaborating to pay it forward by supporting Pressbooks, sharing publishing best practices with the Open Textbook Network, sharing our BC Open Textbook collection with Manitoba and Ontario, and partnering with Lumen Learning, Open Oregon, and Washington State to host the Cascadia Open Education Summit. When we collaborate, we invite stakeholders into the process early as a partner and not late as a judge. While it is true that successful collaborations can be hampered due to challenges such as people, communication, and competition, we collaborate because the goal is to improve student learning outcomes and to ensure students' success. And we know that alone we cannot accomplish this task. Our greatest resource is the relationships we build in our community through collaboration. Origin stories matter. Every person has the right to learn and every person has the right to feel a sense of belonging in their classroom and curriculum. Share origin stories. Ask others theirs. Ask your students how their origin story is reflected in the curriculum. And we need to also be asking our institution what their origin story is, its culture, its response to change, which will inform us how it will respond to the radical challenge of open. And we know the data. We know that student loan debt is debilitating and students face choices that aren't logical, meal or books. Open education is the response to the origin story of education as a privileged good. To make these cultural shifts, I ask that we step back and we remind ourselves of why we do this work. How do we achieve our Iowa? How we move forward has to be through collaboration. Find others working on similar projects. Look across institutional structures and across borders. Be curious. Look for alternative solutions to complex problems because education is not a single issue struggle, which means there's multiple strategies to bring to the table. As I look into the future of education, and in particular open education, Systematic and sustainable change is about working together, sharing knowledge, and tweaking outside of our silos, because together we can achieve success for our students. Thank you.